All right, all right. <laughs> How are we doing this morning? Good to be here. Welcome. I am excited. My name is Victor. I'm lead pastor here at this Surrey location. It's so good to be with you this morning. And we are in this beautiful little micro series called This is Village Church. You've already heard from Pastor Chris. He launched the whole thing for us talking about our mission statement, why we exist. And then just last week, we had Pastor Michael talk about one of our high priorities, if not the most important thing about who we are, the gospel and all the implications of that. Today, you get me, and then next week, you're going to hear from Pastor Mark talking about culture. Very excited. Now, who am I? Maybe some of you aren't really familiar across our sites. Maybe you've seen me preach a couple times. Well, this is who I am. I'm married to a, oh, I'm not married to that. No, no, no. Well, I am, scripture's important. But this is my family. This is my family, my beautiful wife, Kristen. We've been married for now 10 years, the 10 year anniversary coming up in a month. Really excited about that. And our beautiful little half her kids, there's London, Jackson, there's Denver over here. So three amazing kids. Kristen and I have been doing ministry for just about almost 15 years now together. And six of those years have been here at Village Church. Uh, just before, or just as I was wrapping up my seminary degree, that's when I came on staff here at Village Church. And we built what we call our Village School of Ministry. And so we've been doing that. And then last year and a half, I moved over to leading this site, which I love doing, love the people here. So excited about the future and what's ahead. But what you need to know, this is the most important thing moving forward as Pastor Jeremy communicated to all of us, is things are going to change this next phase. And you're not just going to hear from me, but you're going to hear from a variety of preachers. And this is a good thing because not only do you get different personalities, not only do you get different styles, but you get to hear the gospel from different vantage points, different perspectives. You're going to hear the gospel in a different way that's going to connect with you from a variety of communicators on this stage. It's something I'm really excited about. And something you need to know about me and maybe my style of communication. I'm a little more teachy than preachy. And some of you are like, yeah. Some of you are like, what? Like, you're going to be maybe taking notes on this. This is my heart. My heart is that we would open this book. I know this is everyone's heart that gets on stage here, but that this book would be so approachable for you. That it wouldn't be this old ancient text that just means nothing to you. You have no idea how to grasp it. My heart as a communicator, and hopefully what comes through today, is this book just comes alive to you. It makes sense. I love theology. I love history. I love talking about philosophy, all this stuff. But it has to be pragmatic. It has to connect with our day-to-day -day lives. And so my heart is that this thing, just breathe life into what you're going through, whatever's happening in your week to week, and it just comes together and comes to life in your hearts. And so hopefully we can do that this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9. So Village Church, from its conception, uh, it was a bunch of people that gathered in a room, anchored themselves around this vision, as, as Pastor Chris talked about two weeks ago, we exist to see people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus. You know, those couple words, those couple statements has now compelled now thousands of people to not only give generously, but to sacrifice their time and to serve, to actually give their marriage a second shot, to connect with their estranged kids and forgive them, to heal, to have victory over sin, to say yes to the call overseas and to find community here at Village Church. What started as just a couple words with a couple people in a townhome as they launched this church has now become the mission statement, the purpose statement of so many people's lives as they move forward all across Canada. It's beautiful. And as you heard weeks before, this all, this idea, this statement, this vision sifts down into three priorities, gospel, community, and culture. And today I'd like to talk to you about culture and the implications for us. Now, if we're super honest, this last year and a half and a, a bit has been, it's been a bit like survival mode, if, if we're really being honest. Like, we're just a bit reluctant. You guys remember when we, like, scavenged for toilet paper? That wasn't that long ago. Like, in full honesty, like, how many people in this room, like, piled up in toilet paper? Just raise your hands. It's okay. This is a safe place. It's okay. You're among friends. I was one of them. I got a little too many more rolls than I needed. 
I remember like seeing the grocery aisles and it looked kind of Armageddon-esque, like where you would look down the aisle and like huge chunks of things were missing. I look down at the aisle and I see this massive oversized bag of rice. And I just go with my wife, I'm like, we are buying that rice. We need that rice, we need to bunker down. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like already going dark where it's like, I have to portion out this rice for my children. They're pale faces without vegetables or iron, any vitamins. They're just gonna be eating rice for the rest of the, the next couple of years. I was already going there. We got a little paranoid, didn't we? But there's still some residue, I think, in us still today. There's a bit of a reluctancy, a bit of a caution towards overcommitting to community or friends, or, or, or we're kind of just bunkering down and taking care of, of our own. I think some of that is appropriate. Some of that makes sense, I can understand that. But I think for us, the danger here is just staying in the fog of just getting by. And we, I think we have to fight against our nature of just, it's me and my own. Because then we lose sight of like, what is this? Like, what, why are we all here in this room? What is the point of this? That becomes blurry if it's just me and my own and my family and we're just worried about ourselves. How do we define this then? And so today what I'd love to do is kind of cut through the fog a little bit and reimagine what this is and what this could be for us as a community. So 1 Peter 2, sorry, I'll get rid of this. 1 Peter 2, opening line right here. I do a classic Mark thing, we'll stop here. You, you, one word. I'm gonna spend the whole 40 minutes here. This, this thing right here, you. This is the most definitive thing about you. It trumps personality tests. It trumps positions, titles, being a CEO, being important power. It trumps the need from like approval from your friends, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, your CEO, your boss. But it also trumps the lies that we just often believe that the failures that are stacked up against us, our history that haunts us, of who we think we are, we're a failure, we're a screw up. All of this dies and what usurps it is the God of the universe comes in and speaks to us, the God who created all things and sustains all things and says, I, hey, eyes here, eyes here, forget all that mess, forget who defines you, I make the call, I'm the one that brings definition to you, me and me alone, nothing else but me. And how does he define us? What identity does he give us? Well, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Peter, the author of this book, just literally handpicks, cherry picks the best promises, the best identifiers in the Old Testament and just slaps them on the church. So this is who you are, nothing else. So what kind of identity is this? Well, it's interesting, these words, look at this. We can get a little teachy here. Chosen race, a royal priesthood, holy nation. These are all plural, plural, plural words. So one of the most defining things about you in your identity is that your identity is communal. When God looks at you and Jesus looks down at you and he sees you, he sees one that's grafted in a community in the people of God and the church. That's the most definite thing about you. And this, in verses 10, this is how clear it is. It says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had no definition about you. You had no identity, you weren't anything. There was nothing defining about you. You were kind of just there. And then through the gospel and the work of Jesus, this marvelous thing happens where you are defined, not just as anybody, but God's people is your identity. That's the definition you have. And this is a crazy thing. Not only because it's, it's undeserved and it's the merit of grace, it's this beautiful picture of the gospel, but it's literally the opposite of what our culture preaches to us today. You don't find identity in community. Our cultural moment tells us self-discovery doesn't happen in the group of friends. It's actually detachment from friends and family and origin, any of that stuff. It's the vicious fight for autonomy for pursuing individual expression. That's where your identity lies. It's the, it's the promise of the open road, right? 
Like it's the classic picture of the young adult person who is like leaving their family, buying that cool like European backpack with the sleeping bag on the top and traveling off to Europe to find themselves, right? Like that's what I did. When I was like 17 years old, I legit bought that backpack, the sleeping bag on top. Like I had the whole image. I was looking the part. I went to Europe with a bunch of friends. We did like Austria, Germany, Italy. We did the whole thing, cafe shops. We stayed in like these crazy shady hostels where it was like, you're clinging onto your passport like this as you sleep. You're like, I'm gonna die tonight. I don't even know who's in this room. Like the whole European experience, like <laughs> you got what you paid for. And I remember, I remember coming home like pretty deflated. I probably had like $1,000 on my dad's credit card. I had a ton of laundry for my mom to do. Like there was like gangrene in there. I don't know what was living in that bag. But I remember coming home, not this uh, great epiphany of like, man, I found myself, self-discovery. This is who I am. My identity is in myself. No, I didn't find anything. On the contrary, author John Joseph Powell states, hey, catch this, it's important. I can only know that much of myself which I have the courage to confide in others. So your identity isn't discovered in escapism. Your identity is discovered in rallying around good Jesus-loving people that you can be open with, authentic with, you can be real with. That's where you discover your identity. That's where you find yourself. Now, there's a famous psychologist that... Um, wrote down how we relate to each other, how we connect, how we communicate to each other in kind of five categories. I think this will be helpful to frame our conversation today. And so the first category is cliche. So this is very much like social cues. We operate on an autopilot. It's like, how are you doing? Good. I don't know if you've ever like, it's so autopilot that like, I don't know if you've ever had this moment. Maybe it's just me and I'm like missing the mark completely that like, I remember going into a coffee shop. You ever had this moment where like in your, I'm talking to the cashier and he says, what's up? And I say, good. <laughs> and at that point, like the conversation's done, it's dead. Like you're just, there's nothing left to salvage. You just grab your coffee, you pay, you're like whistling just to kind of fill the air and just like, okay, thanks. And you, you walk your way. Like this is almost subconscious, this idea of like, it's the, the talk in the office, how you doing, good. And then it moves to facts. So this is just an exchange of information. How was your week? What did you do this week? Oh, we went to Whistler. Oh, we dropped off our kids at this museum thing. You're exchanging information from each other. Nothing really uh, intimate or intense about that. And it moves down the line of opinions. And there's opinions where it's like, what do you think about the election? You know, what are your thoughts on vaccines right now? You're exchanging ideas and information and going deeper on like, I actually wanna know what you believe about the world. And then fourth is feelings. And this is obviously pretty self-explanatory. Emotions get baked into this, like I'm pessimistic about the future. I'm sad about this family dynamic that I'm dealing with. Emo you're sharing emotions and how you're actually doing in your emotional state. And this last kind of level, which very few people get to, is this deep level of transparency, of intimacy, where it's like, this is all of me. This is who I am, the good, the bad, the ugly. This person knows me in and through. They can speak into any area of my life and vice versa. I have this deep relationship with this person where I can share all of who I am. And the tragedy, and what scares me a little bit, if I'm honest, is if, as the church, if we stay here, like we, we can't afford to stay here. There's too much at stake. If the sum total of your interactions here in, in this body, in this family, in this community is like you wave to the parking tenant and you, you kind of, you're dodging the greeters. Like you just, oh, they're talking to someone I'm gonna squeeze by. And like you're making small talk, maybe with the coffee person. Or maybe you made small talk with the person beside you before worship started and then you just sneak out the back door. Like if that's the sum total of your connection here, then verse, passages like Galatians 6, 2, they start to rub up against you and it says, bear one another's burdens so to fulfill the law of Christ. Like you actually can't, you can't do that. It becomes impossible for you. If, if this is all of your relationship to the church, it's like, how are you ever gonna share a burden with anyone? How are you ever gonna open up? You can't actually move forward in your walk with Jesus in this area of your life if you're not having intimate, authentic relationships. 
this becomes impossible for us. The call for us as a church, especially Village Church, we need to move down. We need to move down. We need to have meaningful relationships here. And now I don't mean that like everyone in this room just open up and confess sin. It's like, how are you doing? My marriage is falling apart. Or like, <laughs> we, you know, we all have that friend. Like we all, we all know that person when you're in the line. And <laughs> there's that type of person where like you're just striking up a conversation and you're just, hey, how was your, how was your week? Oh man, just had a colonoscopy operation. <laughs> And it's like, whoa, how did we get here? It went from like zero to 100. And it's like, what is happening? Now you're locked in. And they start like sharing inf- more information and details. And you're just like, I just wanted to talk about the game. Like, I don't know how we got here. We all know those people. So yes, there is the right place. There is the right people. There's the right scenario where we need to have those conversations. In fact, Edward Hall, a psychologist in the, his book, The Search to Belong, argues humans only actually have the capacity for certain types of relationships. He says that uh, if we're to go across here, you can only have two to four, two to four kind of transparent, personal, he defines this as personal. You can have maybe five to 12. And then this idea of opinions and facts, what he categorizes as social. You can have like 20 to 50. And then in your life, this kind of cliche, which he calls public, you can, only, you can have 70 plus. Those are just public interactions that you're having with people if you can read any of that. I don't know. <laughs> but here's, here's the idea. As much as we, we need to move this conversation down, my question to you is, where do people in this room, are you watching online or at your sites, where do those people sit? And if they only sit here in this public and social world, man, we are done. We are in trouble. If you're convinced church is something that you can just spectate and that community is something you can take a pass on, that's the thing that the enemy just daydreams about. Like the mantra of like, I'm going in alone, that makes you low picking fruit. My, my kids and I, we love to watch like animal videos. We love to watch on YouTube. We'll just watch like fail blogs of animals like falling off of like a bed and stuff. And they'll just love it, they'll laugh. You know, like the classic like National Geographic video of like there's the gazelle by the pond drinking and then there's the lion in the tall grass. And it's like, oh yeah, the tall, the, the lion. I'm not gonna, no, I'm gonna try. I'm not gonna try to do the Australian accent. <laughs> I'm just eject. Um, but you know that moment, that scene, right? Where they are about to prowl on the gazelle. And what does the lion go after? Does he go after the strongest gazelle? Does he go after the weakest gazelle? No. Maybe the, the oldest gazelle? No. He goes after the gazelle that's alone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, a Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged for by himself, he cannot help uh, himself without belaying the truth. You know, we just baptized 20, over 20 people last a couple weeks ago, and it was an incredible experience here at Surrey to people to publicly proclaim their faith in Jesus and to go into the waters denying their old self and coming into new life. It was an amazing thing that we got to celebrate here at this site. You know, but when I, when I watched, there was one person who had no family and friends there. They went in alone and we baptized them and they came out of the waters and I saw him get out of the pool and I saw the most beautiful thing of this older fellow just wrapping his arms around him and just praying with him. Like, where else do you get that? Like that's the church when strangers come together and say, hey, we are one, we are one body, we are the community. Let me pray for you. What you lack, I will make up. That is the heart. The church, we need to move down. You know, when I was, when COVID first hit, uh, it was really hard for me, if I'm honest. Like, my job was shifting. We didn't know where, like, the church was, like, had to pivot. Um, my friend groups, we were all isolated. So we, like, committed. A bunch of guy friends and my, myself, we all committed to, like, we're going to have a bonfire every Friday night. We're going to do social distancing, get lawn chairs, and we're just going to stay up till 1 o'clock in the mornings. Our wives loved it. Uh, and we would do this, like, religiously. Like, we had to be there every Friday night. And we would just, like, love it. We'd be 
having like, uh, we'd be just hanging out, goofing off, telling stories, telling jokes, just like almost a detoxing from the week, the intensity of just, this is a tough week. Like some guys were like losing their jobs. Like some people were like unemployed for months and just trying to navigate like deep questions of like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't even really know what my calling is. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. They're talking about marriage. We're talking about struggles. We're talk- opening up about real things. We're moving the conversation down. We're praying for each other, we're encouraging each other, we're affirming each other. It was most, during the most hard, hardest difficult times for us in COVID that Jesus actually used it and shaped who I was amongst these guys that I loved. The author of Hebrews has this interesting thing about Jesus. He says he's the author and perfecter of our faith perfecter of our faith, this idea of he will help us endure. He will help us get through to the finish line. He will help us make it through. He'll preserve our salvation. And I just genuinely believe that's a group effort. That's a group project. Just like the bonfire that we're having, it's like he's using people around you that love Jesus to encourage you, to edify, to move you forward, to make it through, to clarify who you are within community. And that's my question to you is like, who are those people to you? Are you overlooking people that God is literally placing around you? Hey, I want to sanctify you. I want to transform you. I want to work on that sin area. I'm putting people in your life and you're overlooking them because they're staying right here. You just want to keep them surface, surface level. Who are the people that God's put in your life to shape you? And so we read in this, as we carry on this passage, this next interesting piece of like when it comes to who we are, What kind of community is this? How are we defining ourselves? There's this interesting, almost climactic part. It says, your chosen race, it's this building tension, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And then it climaxes at this idea, people for his own possession. This is loaded language that maybe kind of like goes over our head in the, in the Western world, in the 21st century. But if you think about back then, that would have been triggered and alluded to actually a king's possession. And a king would have like this play money set aside like this treasury that like it couldn't be taxed and couldn't be like officials couldn't get their greedy hands on. It was like his own like allowance. I don't know if you have that. Like when you're doing your budget with your wife, you have literally set aside money. Like you can't ask questions around this kind of budget line. For me, it's food. Like I will have no problem dropping like 25 bucks on a pizza and it's like, do you want like cheesy crust? Yes. Do you want extra dip? Yes. I'm not even bad at an eye. It's like extra pepperoni, of course. You know, you know we want to know my greatest temptation as a pastor. I'm just opening it up here. And the guy's like, yes, I do. <laughs> Give me the goods. It's 1.30 o'clock today. 1.30 o'clock every Sunday. Everything's done. Services are over. We're pushing the road cases. Trucks are out. We're tired, moving past lunchtime a little, maybe a little hangry. And it's when I get into the parking lot and across the line, Popeyes right there. <laughs> it's Popeyes, those greasy perfumes just making their way, luring my heart over there. You know, and everything means like, no, I, don't know, I should be budgeted for that. We should be, I should just go home and eat a grilled cheese sandwich. And it's like I'm pulled in. There are days. There are days where I come home with a crumbled up bag of shame. <laughs> my wife sees, you know. But for my wife, it's like, it's like she'll buy a pair of shoes like once a year. And I'm like, I'm looking at her scarfing down my pizza with extra crust or whatever. And it's like, that feels irresponsible. Don't you have a pair of shoes already? So it's like the, <laughs> the key here is priesthood, holy nation. What these words are screaming at us is unique, set apart for his use. Now, What's undergirding this kind of uniqueness, set-apartness, is this interesting word. What makes us so different than the world has to offer is this one word here, marvelous, marvelous light. This can be translated also as wonder or awe, that we are people of wonder. You marvel at the fact that you are called and you are chosen. Like, how, how did this even happen? Like, how am I saved? Like, you ever wonder, you just assume, of course I'm Christian. It's like, no, 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 you're in this current constant state of like, how is Jesus still with me? 
How did I get this far? I think about my own life, who's like riddled with sin issues in my past, like struggling through making so many mistakes in my past. I was like a hollowed out person in my youth. I just felt like there's no way forward with Jesus and fighting God tooth and nail. And he's viciously pursuing me. And he's like, hey, 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 eyes here, eyes here. My possession, set apart, chosen, your holy nation is defining me. In this moment, in that moment, I'm just like, I, I, no. Like, I feel sinner, wicked, gross. He said, no, 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 no. Because of what Jesus has done the cross for you, that he put all your sin to death and rose again. And now he's calling me out. He's chosen me, he's pulling me out and he's healing me. He's let me have victory over sin. He's moving me forward. He's actually equipping me to the point now where I just stand on stage here. I'm sharing the good news with you. Like, what is that? Like, how does that happen? Not because of me, because of him. Like, do you marvel? Do you, are you in awe? Are you wonder? Like, how am I here? How has he done such, how is he still with me? And the same is for you. Those who are steeped in addiction, those who are burnt past relationships, those who are struggling with, you're haunted by past mistakes, chosen. Set apart, I ain't done with you, keep moving. That's his heart for you and you, he moves you through and he gets, you get to the tail end of this thing and you're just standing there in awe and that's that moment where everything changes. You're just like, how? And your view of relationships, sex, money, work, family, purpose, the way you view the world and yourself in it, all of that just changes. You're the people of wonder, we just operate differently. And this has been since day one, right out of the gate in early church. One person, Tim Keller, comments on the state of the early church and how they were set apart and different. He says, the pagan society was stingy with its money and, but promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave their money and practically gave everybody their body. And Christians come along and gave practically nobody their body and they practically gave everybody their money. Another author says Christians are called out of insignificance into significance. That's the idea of being the people of God. You weren't a people, now you are. And continues and says you can, they can never be ordinary because they're the people of God. And I think it's appropriate for you, for all of us to just kind of pause and reflect and do a little inventories. Is this true of me? Like I said yes to Jesus, have I seen any movement in my life? Or have I just got caught up in the motions and I've fallen back into the ordinary? I've fallen back into the insignificant. You know, I, I know COVID, I'm talking about COVID a lot. I, clearly, I need some, there's some healings. <laughs> For COVID, maybe some of you guys, it's just this pandemic, it's just like, it's brought you through a whirlwind. And it's like, I don't even know where I stand on things. I'm going through the motions. I'm just trying to survive. I'm not thinking about faith. I'm not, it's like, I'm neither here nor there. And I think here's what's at stake. What's at stakes for us? A journalist, Ben Sexsmith, wrote um, about the tragic moral failure of a celebrity pastor, but he doesn't just speak about this specific pastor. He speaks about the trend in American evangelical Christianity and mainstream culture calling it Christianity with a twist. He's kind of critiquing Christians pursuing mainstream culture with a splash of Christianity on it. This is what he says. I'm not religious, so it's not my place to dictate it to Christians what they should or should not believe. Still, if someone has faith worth following, I feel that those beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values and there is nothing especially inspiring about them, instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. It's the call, the call is to be set apart because the world needs a church that is different, that looks nothing like what's on offer in our current state. And so the pervading question for us is set apart to do what? Why did God choose us? Why did God call us? Why did the gospel work in us? Why did Jesus die for our sins? What was the purpose of why he did all this? It's this word right here that you may, what are you supposed to do? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. 
you are a community that is designed, set apart to be on the mission of Jesus. That's your purpose. Now, the funny thing is, this is where it gets weird for us. Now, we talked about, man, we, as a church, we got to move the conversation down. we got to have better relationships. we got to have people that love Jesus in this area here. But almost what's equally worse is like when, the, when our church community is like this. Is this. <laughs> this is what we call weird Christian culture. <laughs> when your whole world is the church. And I, I, I've had a taste of this, if I'm honest. Like, I remember when I was young, I wasn't allowed to play violent video games. It's probably good parenting, but there was one. There was one game I was allowed to play that was violent, kind of. It was called Spiritual Warfare. <laughs> and this game was legit. You didn't kill people, you converted them by using, like, <laughs> you would use... The arm, you collect armor of God pieces, like boots, shields, everything. You like stack up your armor, level up. And the final thing you collect would be the best thing was like the sword of the spirit. And when you level that thing up, it would like shoot lasers, like holy lasers at people. And you convert people that way. And you would also collect the fruits of the spirit. I think they took like a very literal interpretation of what the fruits of the spirit meant, where you legit just collect fruits. Like they'd go around, there'd be apples, which would be like grenades. And bananas would be like boomerangs. It's like you'd fight off demons with these things. This was like the most forming experience of like following Jesus for me in my childhood. But it's not just me. It's like, I remember other families, they would play the game of sorry, right? Everyone knows the game of sorry. It's like you, you bump the person, you have to go back to the beginning and you're sorry. And it's like that classic move. And there's cards in there that say revenge. And so as someone bumps you, it's like you counter bump, right? And, and one mom, makes their kids cross over revenge and write, forgiven. It's powerful. <laughs> so when your big brother, you know, bumps, you have to go to the beginning, you, you give him the card. Hey, you're forgiven. <laughs> Love you, man. It's the gospel. It's gospel interact, gospel fluency happening in the game of story. But I, or maybe some of you, like, it's not just, you know, games where it's even around superstition. It's like my past, one of my past churches I would go to, it's like, we didn't believe in potlucks. Like, I don't know, maybe this relates to some of you, like potlucks, we, because Christians don't believe in luck, right? We believe in sovereignty of God. And so we would call them pot blesses, <laughs> pot blesses. It was amazing. You'd be pot, you'd go to the pot bless. And so whatever your, whatever your take is on like, man, I feel like I've been burnt by the church or like, I don't like the way that guy said that thing on stage or like the pastor never reached out to me. It's like, man, I survived pot blessings. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. We're gonna get through this. But here's, <laughs> we get weird, don't we? When we get around each other too much. If our entire relational world is the church, and I think Jesus thinks so too. It's like cow manure. When you put all that manure together, that thing just stinks. It doesn't really have a purpose, it's just there. But when you spread that manure around, man, things grow, life happens, right? And so we need to spread around a little more. And when we think about this idea of community, being on mission, it's not that mission is a component of community, it is the identity of our community. And here's what I mean by this. There's a, there's a woman who grew up in a really unhealthy a family, and she actually went to, um, she went into the punk rock scene, and that actually introduced her to the neo-Nazi scene, and I remember, like, she was totally bought in, where she would, like, uh, graffiti, like, black neighborhoods, she would, like, pour, uh, throw tear gas into, like, gay clubs. This is her quote, in retrospect, my transformation was so complete, I would have died for it. Would have died for it, that's interesting. I think there's things we all would die for, there's something actually psychologists call sacred values that operates in your brain where whether it's family, religion, convictions, deep values, all of us have these things called sacred values. And if those things are being threatened, there's actually this thing in our brain that's really helpful that helps us push back so we're not easily persuaded. It's, it's actually a really helpful thing. And two things happen in our brain to protect us from this. The, the dorsoterial prefrontal cortex, there's a tongue twister. This thing is like rational thinking, logical, all that part of your brain, that part goes offline. So that just 
just dies in your room. Someone's like telling you, trying to convince you out of your beliefs. And then this second piece in the inferior frontal gyrus, this thing goes bonkers. This thing like goes, fires up on all cylinders. And this is like the rash, or this is, sorry, this is like the stubbornness of your brain. Like the, the rule retrieval, it like pushes back against logical thinking. And for this, this woman in this story, here's what one psychologist says, you're not going to be able to talk this person out of their beliefs, but by understanding what are their drivers and the reasons for why the particular person joined this particular group, you can then help them to find a way to address those same needs. So this neo-Nazi woman could never be convinced out of her beliefs, no matter how hateful, anti-authoritative, violent they were, because they were her safe haven for belonging. That's where she found her identity was wrapped up in this community. But it wasn't until she moved into her boyfriend's house, and that, sorry, her boyfriend's mom's house, that she was introduced to a whole new community. Her echo chamber of ideas just broke. And she was able to rethink who she was. Her words was she was rehumanized. She allowed herself to go back to her past hurts of sexual abuse as a child, explore her root cause to heal in a safe environment. And here's the point for us. Your world, your community, if you're to expose people to it, how we operate differently, not in a preachy way, but just by simply inclusion invitation, that can be the loudest sermon people can hear. More than, you know, reading the problem of God, more than a catchy sermon, more than even a good worship experience. For many people, it's just gonna be to have a meal around a table, to have a late night couple of drinks with the guys, to go into a community group and to be, you know, invited into like, hey, come to the picnic with us. I don't know if you guys do picnics. Um, what would it look like if we were that kind of church? If we are moved by that? If Canadian government stats are saying two out of 10 are mostly or always lonely, 20% of Canada is crying out saying, I'm always lonely. Maybe the thing we can meet them, the, the need that can be met isn't necessarily more apologetics, better theology or a better worship experience. It's just a simple question of saying, hey, do you wanna come over for dinner tonight? Hey, why don't we grab coffee after we drop off the kids? What would it do if we opened up our lives for Kristen and I, you know, as we invite, we're trying to invite our neighbor over and over to our house, that they would look at us and be like, man, I just I noticed the way you treated your wife. I noticed the way you interact with your kids. Like you just give me your full attention. And I, I hung out with the guys that night at the pub and it's like, they just opened up and no one was judging each other. You know, like, now, I'm not saying we don't preach the gospel. We obviously have to preach and communicate the gospel well, and there's time for that. But all I'm saying is community is the best primer for anyone to experience Jesus and the gospel. It's that what, what one author says, Dietrich Baumhofer, that Jesus stands between the lover and the others he loves. That when you interact with me in my home, it's like, you don't see me. I'm just hiding behind Jesus. What you're seeing is Jesus. The way I serve people, the way I support my family, the way I interact with them, the way I love. That's, I'm just a shadow. Like, you're just getting Jesus. And we need to be a community that the only way to change the world is Jesus in the front of us. If Jesus is moving us forward. You know, with the tragic war between Russia and Ukraine right now, it's, it's changing every day. Uh, there's a growing list of communities that are like putting sanctions on Russia. They're like, yeah, we'll show them. <laughs> and one of them is, uh, is FIFA. So you can't like, Russian players can't play in any international games right now. They're just completely cut off. The second one is, uh, that came to mind is Netflix. So Netflix is just legit canceling Russia. All the R Russian common folk can't watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine or, or Tidy Up with Marie Kondo. Like they're cut off. And the best one was... Um, is uh, the Taekwondo International Federation. They revoked Putin's honorary black belt. That'll, that'll show Russia, right? <laughs> that'll change the war. But you see, there's, this, there's community. Communities think that they, doing these things, they can bring about change. And there's actually probably something in all of us that wants to believe this is true, but it's not. It's only the church that can bring about change in the world. You see, this community, for us, 
isn't just a place where we you know, gather together and share burdens, confess sin, encourage each other. It's a community that moves forward. It's a community of action. God wiring all of you in this room with different gifts and skills to bring about change in the city of Surrey and Toronto and Calgary, all the sites across Canada to move the gospel forward to make a difference or to be a force of justice, to be a force of reconciliation, to be a force of generosity. It's only the church that's centered around the person that can only change everything, that can only go down to the hearts of man and change their lives. It's only him and him alone. And in this room, wherever you're watching, whatever site you're at, that we're be a people that's chosen and set apart, not just for our sake, but for the world's sake that we would be a people that would love and advocate and pursue that the gospel would move forward all across Canada. The mission of Jesus would move forward. It would be that kind of community. So Village Church, can we move towards this more and more aggressively as we move into this, this next phase ahead? So Father, that's our prayer. We pray, we recognize we live in a, a cultural moment that has transactional relationships that sees friends as like, what can I get out of you? But to be that different that I'm like, it doesn't matter what I can get out of you. I just want to love you. I want to be present. I want to listen. That can change everything. Lord, that would be a community that is centered around Jesus and life would come out of that. We wouldn't just be a community that's all about the church and just centered around us. We'll be missional in every breath that we take that would be outward focused towards people who need the gospel deeply. Help us be stirred up by that. The community on mission for you. We pray this in your namesake. Amen.